All right, and welcome back. You know, I really ought to get a catchphrase. All right, and welcome back is a terrible way to start a lecture. You're like, welcome, students of art history. I don't know. All right, I got to focus group some things. Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about conceptual and pop art, but I'm actually going to start at an interesting place. So if you're watching us on YouTube, I'll put a link down in the description. If you're watching it on Canvas, the link's on Canvas. But where I want to start is with this film. This is a film made in 1958 by Chevrolet, General Motors, called The American Look. And it's all about design in the mid-century, in the modern era. 1958 is probably the height of modernism in the United States. And everything about it is just a treasure trove. It's like an incredible time capsule not just of 50s nostalgia, but of exactly where modernism was in the middle of the 20th century in terms of consumerism and opinion and everything else. And so go take a look at it. It's only about 30 minutes long. Then come back and watch this lecture because it sets up the entire lecture right from the title page, which is clearly borrowed from Mondrian and De Steel, We have the complete triumph of modernism. It goes through and it makes a case that design and consumerism are good and that in particular modernism and this ever increasing improvement of objects and of consumer goods is good and right and just and demonstrations of your good taste. And everything in it is just absolute, incredibly straight across the board modernist. I mean, look at these things. You could buy most of these things in Ikea today. <laughs> Here is a living room. Here is a den. Nothing is traditional. Nothing is from the past in the office spaces. Even the drawers are color-coded in the way that, you know, Justiel used to color-code things, that Reitveld and Mondrian used to color-code things. When you take a look there, you see chairs, and there it is, the Barcelona chair. This was designed by Mies van der Rohe back in 1929 for the Barcelona Pavilion. So the champions of modernism are absolutely triumphant. Their ideas and designs are everywhere and fully imbued into the mass-produced post-World War II consumer culture. How imbued? There's even a gag in this video, this movie. It's hilarious because they show you all these beautiful modernist buildings, and then as they back away from the latest modernist building, out pops a dog. Even your doghouse has to be modern. That's how absolutely imbued this is. Now, the first half of it is just talking about the nature of design. For a, sh a film made about by a car manufacturer, you think there would be something about cars, but there isn't anything on cars until the very end. Almost all of it is about selling consumerism as a lifestyle, and every feature of that consumerism is modern. From the office, office spaces with its uh, hanging and floating staircases to its window spaces, they even have a section on the designers. And the designers, of course, are going to be white, pipe-smoking men in their, you know, horn rim glasses. You could not have a more cliche image of designers if you tried. This idea that serious men smoking pipes, that's my serious men voice, uh, at least my 1950 serious man voice, they are going to make the things that you buy, and they'll be beautiful and functional and uh, you know, all the rest. But I want you to look into the background. Even the art on the background is modern. There are snippets where you see people walking down hallways, and the stuff that was considered radical 50 years earlier, just insanely radical, are now mainstream. There is nothing in this that you see anything of traditional art or traditional style or traditional design at all. And it is a all, a gigantic gigantic pain, pain, an elegy to consumerism and mass consumerism in the post-war era. It's really worth looking at the whole thing in full. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> it's amazing amount of civilizational confidence, but all in the service of mass consumerism, which of course sets up where contemporary art goes and why contemporary art has to break from the past.
So I know you, this is probably no surprise to any of my long-term students, but I'm huge into economic and social theory. Uh, I'm essentially a social art historian. I love looking at you know things like economic theory. I'm, I was actually writing a book for a while uh, that I called uh, The Big Fix, which was talking about uh, consumerism and uh, visual culture and labor and manufacturing policy in the 1950s and 60s. I later abandoned it because I got more into non-Western stuff and stopped doing it. But I, I was writing about it because uh, I liked fix, because fix is a word that has multiple meanings. The big fix, a fix is like an addiction. And that's what consumerism had become. But it's also a fix. When you fix a fight, that means it's not fair. And I thought it was a great title. Uh, problem was, I just didn't have the skill to write the book. Eh, maybe I'll come back to it. But in the post-war period, we have an amazing historical accident. And the echoes of this accident are still, oh my gosh, echoing through all out the generations. America emerged from World War II as the only industrial power with its manufacturing capacity intact. Europe was devastated. Japan was devastated. No one else could touch us. And other than some Pearl Harbor and some attacks on the Aleutian Isles, uh, almost nothing in America was actually impacted. And we also did something else. Most countries after the war continued the kind of regulatory regimes that were created in the war. Somebody was telling me that in the 1970s, they were still making school desks and hospital beds according to regulations in the UK, that is. They were still making um, hospital beds and school desks according to regulations set down in World War II, which is absurd. You know, that was the regulatory regime. But Truman just said, nope, we're done. And he took the massive, almost socialized economy of the wartime economy, and he just auctioned it all off and handed it off to uh, capitalist corporate America uh, at pennies on the dollar. And so it made a real boon. But America boomed. And because we had the goods and no one else did, we became the factory and we became the shop and the retailer to the world. And we benefited enormously. And you can see the echoes of this everywhere. It truly was an era where people could go out of high school and with a high school degree, go right into the middle class. I remember I, I collect things in ephemera from the 1950s. I don't know where this wound up. I lost it. But I had a collection of magazines from the 1950. These were uh, the Italian language magazines being sold in the South 50, South Philly in the 1950s. And they had classifieds in mixed Italian and English in the back. So it was for the Italian American community living in South Philly. But one of the things that amazed me was the, uh, the classifieds. And in the classifieds, there was this ad for a marketing executive, high school diploma only needed, and all you need to do was that and an essay test, and you could walk into a job in 1955 making $11,000, which today would be, you know, similar to 50 or 60 grand. That's astonishing. So all these OK Boomer memes that you see on where the millennials complain about boomers saying, well, when I was young, I went right to a job and I got to it. Uh, the truth is... Uh, millennials and Gen Xers and Generation Zs really got a raw deal relative to the boomers. The boomers benefited from this incredible boom in consumerism that existed. And all of this consumerism was wrapped in modernist aesthetic. And something changed. Something changed in America that consumerism used to be a negative thing. It's now since become a negative thing again. But prior to this, the idea of consumption was considered gross, gluttonous, you know, you, you worked hard for what you got, but you got things that had value and you held on to them. But manufacturers discovered that something had changed. When we talk about planned obsolescence, the conspiracy, the conspiracy theories are that planned obsolescence is that companies started making things break down and making them out of cheap plastic, so you were forced to buy new things. But that's actually got the cart before the horse. The reality is that they discovered that consumers were already buying new products long before the old products wore out. So there was no sense in putting a lot of effort into a well-made product because in one or two years, they were just gonna change up and buy a new product anyway. Consider iPhones. I mean, you know, you have a phone for a couple of years. I had an iPhone, uh, well, not an iPhone, 
but I had a, uh, a smartphone and it lasted four years. It finally died. I took it into the store and everybody, all of the people in the store had to pass it around and say, wow, this is so old. Because <laughs> most people replace their technology every two to three years. I'm on a PC that's 10 years old doing this and that's really ancient for PCs. It's, you know, in dog years, it's like 800 years old in terms of technology. Well, that consumer society where you just buy the latest and new thing because it has more power, you know, new features, new doodads, that really began in the post-war period. And so they said, what really drives the market isn't the quality of the product, it's choice. And choice comes in a lot of flavors and it's about taste. And so we commercialized this desire for the ever new, this commercialized, this desire for something that is constantly new, something that's constantly re renewed. And if you listen to that video on the American Look, you'll hear this language, constantly updating, constantly improving products, coming out with new products, with new features. It's all about new. Well, this fed into a kind of neoliberalist consumerist worldview where <sighs> consumerism was good. The consumerism drove the economy that put more money into the economy, that made the economy bigger, that created more jobs. And so growth became an expectation of society and exponential growth became an expectation of society. Now there's a lot of negative consequences of that growth. Um, all those rare earth minerals and our, our electronics have to come from somewhere and those mines are often not very nice in environmental places. There's also climate change and global warming, the costs of our energy usage, etc. not to mention the plastic and our rivers and our waters and our oceans and all the consumer features of it. But I'm not gonna be a hypocrite. I mean, the truth is all of us are up to our eyeballs in this consumer culture and I like my shiny toys, even though I, you know, I, I recently got a new phone. My, my new phone's only a few months old. Uh, but, you know, even though, you know, we have all these toys, we like those toys. And I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say I'm going to turn my back on all of this. And I talked to my graphic design students and I said, I hate to break it to you. You know, you, you try to be conscious and self-conscious about your um, and aware of the impact of your decisions. But graphic design jobs exist because of this consumerism, because we're constantly having to market and design and new products. And if we didn't have this consumerism, well, we wouldn't have jobs, you wouldn't have jobs, etc. After a while, this kind of becomes like a snake eating its own tail. And now we have huge questions of whether it's sustainable, economically, environmentally, etc. But for whatever reason, that was the thing that caused this huge consumer boom. And, you know, I think the, the baby boomers were rather hard on their parents in the 1950s and 60s because these were the people of World War II. These were the people of the Depression. They had sacrificed a lot, and a lot of them wanted to just go back to a normal life in the 50s and 60s. I love this ad. After total war, total living. <laughs> I mean, oh, that's cringy today. You would never do that, but there it is. And so you have an entire generation grow up defined by their consumer choices. You know, my my dad was a Pontiac man, and we used to make the joke that there's this joke out of Christmas Story, the movie uh, by Bob Clark that uh, stars, interestingly enough, the guy who ended up being the producer for Iron Man. Crazy. Uh, so, um, the uh, he says that you know some people were Baptists, some people were Presbyterians. My dad, you know, was a Buick man. And that was the good joke, that we no longer defined ourselves by our religions or our creeds, we defined ourselves by our consumer goods. I wear t-shirts that say Coca-Cola because I consume more Coca-Cola than, you know, um, a small developing nation. Uh, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm like Coca-Cola's biggest customer after, you know, like Europe. And uh, so uh, it's really kind of funny. And I do, I, and people define themselves by whether they're Apple people or PC people, they define themselves by Tesla, by their brands. And it's only getting more so as we go into the era of social media. We define ourselves, even our morality, by our consumer choices. And now we do it, you know, com corporations completely assimilated the green phenomenon. So you buy from green companies. Well, how green are they if they're making that much consumer goods? always have to question it. And so it seemed like an empty age, an empty age of just crass materialism. I think that's unfair. I think if you realize these people were, you know, coming out of uh, uh, the Great War, not the Great War, World War II and the Great Depression, 
uh, you can understand why they did it. And just as corporate culture has completely assimilated uh, you know, environmentalism and ecological concerns to get us to buy their goodies, back then corporate culture completely assimilated modernism. Modernism was this ideology, and it actually fused into this pop culture kind of form of modernism that we call googie or populux, which is really amazing stuff. So diners, like this very famous diner out of LA. Uh, I grew up in Las Vegas, the fabulous uh, Las Vegas sign is a hallmark of this mm, French kiss, you know, chef's kiss. I almost said French kiss, but it's a little different than chef's kiss. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Time to drink more Coke. Here we go. All right, which is just mwah, chef's kiss, uh, a perfect example of populux or googie architecture. But even things like Saul Bass, very famous designer, was designing movie posters and everything about our life was you know, assumed in the ideas of modernism. So all those ideals are there. And you can especially see this in the ads and in architecture. Architecture and design, particularly industrial design, furnishings, cars, uh, clothes, all those things were very much in the modernist aesthetic. So here you have an ad for Motorola, uh, you know, where they used to make uh, radios and stereos, etc. But you see this rather incongruous picture where you have a, a kind of quasi neoclassical console stereo in an absolutely completely modern home. So where did this come from? Well, again, the refugees of World War II found their way to America. Uh, Walter Gropius ended up being a professor of architecture at Harvard and was designing things like this. Uh, figures like Philip Johnson, who were started out as art critics and architectural critics, started designing buildings and they started designing these glass boxes very early. And these glass boxes uh, became de rigueur. They were the standard. They started erecting these by the thousands. This is a uh, the Seagram's building. And this was designed by Mies van der Rohe and it was built in 1958 same year the american look came out and you can see it is all surface it is steel and glass there is nothing of the past we have these completely honest and interior environments and of course the four seasons uh, four seasons uh, restaurant at the top was itself looking for a uh, you know a, a mark rothko so these things were wedded perfectly together the all of the concepts of the art world had become mainstream and that's a very important thing to know, that all of the art, the design, was thoroughly and completely modern. And it was more than just that. It was not just that modernism was triumphant. Modernism was actually displacing everything else. And it's important to know this is not an accidental thing. This is not just something that people just said, hey, we like modern, and it happens. It was very much a corporate decision. Modernism fit the cultural aesthetic of the age. It was new, it was futuristic. America was, this. We, we were all talking about America, we're moving into the American century. America was becoming dominant, it was the space age. All of those things fed together, but there were also some very powerful nefarious forces in politics and urban planning, etc. If you're not familiar with Robert Moses, you should be. Robert Moses is probably one of the most important uh, unknown characters. Uh, that he was an urban planner and he had many different positions. He was somebody who was never really elected to office but wound up with putting his thumbprint and his mark on all of New York City. And imbued with this modernist spirit, he began to remake New York. And there is a racial element to this as well. New York had a bunch of diverse ethnic neighborhoods and he defined those ethnic neighborhoods as blight. And so we had mixed commercial and residential neighborhoods that were completely bulldozed. Uh, at one point, he wanted to build a freeway across lower Manhattan that would have completely gotten rid of little Italy and little China. And you can imagine those, you know, gone. And there are such staples of lower Manhattan, you wouldn't even imagine lower Manhattan without those. But he once got, he was gonna get rid of them. and. In the process, he destroyed a lot of historical buildings. Modernism could brook no competition from the past. It was always upward, onward, faster, better. And this is where modernism starts to run aground. Several of the things they end up tearing down end up being these incredible monuments. 
Uh, one of the most important was Penn Station. Penn Station was this monument built uh, by the Pennsylvania Railroad as their kind of grand entry into New York City. And if you know Grand Central Station in New York City, pff, it's it was nothing compared to Penn Station. Penn Station was, you know, amazing. It was this gigantic, beautiful, uh, classical facade. It had waiting rooms that were based on Roman bath architecture of all things. But uh, it was hard to upkeep. It was hard to maintain. And so the thinking was we can put the train station underground and we can build a stadium above it. And now Madison Square Garden, which is not a very attractive stadium, was built above it. And so uh, Penn Station came down. Ironically, now people are trying to rebuild parts of Penn Station because they, they recognize the loss. But people recognize the loss even then. And in 1961, Jane Jacobs wrote about the the death of American cities, how these drives to modernize and you know get rid of blight were really not motivated by um, anything economic. They were motivated by ideologues who had this vision. And not surprisingly, if you were brown skinned, your neighborhood got decided, it got turned into a ghetto. What was a working class neighborhood suddenly got declared a ghetto and got torn down. And then it got replaced by projects and it was really ugly. So Jane Jacobs' book is a phenomenal book and everybody should read it today because it talks about how too many times the things that we look at and like the spread of the suburbs, um, the hollowing out of the city, gentrification, we look at these as kind of, you know, natural phenomenons, but they're not. They're really the product of ideology, of policy, both bad and good, and we should critically examine the motives of everybody involved. Uh, Robert Moses was this guy who really thought he could remake the world in his image. So in many places, these neighborhoods got torn down and turned into projects. This is probably one of the most famous projects. This is the Pruitt Igo housing, which was done in St. Louis. And it became a kind of mark, a kind of symbol of the failure of modernism because no sooner had it gone up, you know, it was once a thriving working class neighborhood, uh, got turned into a project and it became a vertical slum. And even though it was built on the idealist principles of modernists like Le Corbusier and others, uh, Le Corbusier and uh, had designed these ideal cities, uh, these ideal cities turned into vertical slums and, you know, just barely a decade after they were put up in 1958, uh, they were dynamited and imploded. Uh, as a great mistake. So now imagine you're living in this era and imagine that you are the counterculture to this era. Everything is modernist and I do mean everything. The architecture, and let's just go back and, you know, go back to some of our wonderful pictures from American Look. Your furniture, uh, your den, your office, uh, your doghouse, your residence, your office, the art hanging on your walls, everything is modernist and everything is corporatist and you would begin to think gosh i live in a hollow empty world i live in a materialist crass society and so you start to see a counterculture emerge and it emerges very very quickly right in the wake of all this modernist triumphalism you have the beatnik generation uh, the beat generation so you have figures like jack kerouac and also poets like allen ginsberg that you can see here, but you also have radicals like uh, John Cage, who is a musician, but also is the founder of the Black Mountain College. And all of these are rebelling against the emptiness of this, the, the lack of any kind of moral direction. It was very much anti-consumerism. And that means you have to rebel against the art too, remember? Uh, modernists, you know, like Jackson Pollock and de Kooning were at the height of their fame at the end of the 1940s and early 1950s. Uh, they were pulling in $5,000 a painting, which, you know, would be like, you know, gosh, thirty dollars or $50,000 today. Uh, some of them were getting, uh, you know, double figures for paintings. Uh, this would be like, you know, six figures for paintings. These were enormous sums. They were getting massive commissions. Uh, Jackson Pollock was actually being sent on a world tour by the CIA. Now, I know some people Some people say, oh, he was just a phony put up there as a prop by the CIA. Well, that's a ridiculous conspiracy theory. But he was. He was going on international tours that were funded by the CIA. The CIA was looking at this and they were saying, hey, jazz, modernist music, 
this stuff shows how vital America is. Russia was stuck with its socialist realism. It had no vitality. So through a, a series of kind of shell um, corporations and organizations, the CIA funded a, a tour of modernists uh, uh, across the world. And it was, again, you know, a way of saying, hey, America, American consumerism is good. It drives the world economy. It gives people stuff and it's good. But everybody could see the inherent rot in this and the fundamental emptiness of this. So there's a rebellion against this, and the rebellion is coming from these people. And so how do you rebel? If you're, if you're rebelling against modernism, modernism was the avant-garde, but now the avant-garde is the mainstream. You have to do something different than the mainstream. And boy, did they do something different. Uh, John Cage was really out there and really experimental and was very much into Zen philosophy. And Zen philosophy stresses the concept of mu, of nothingness of knowing and understanding your own nothingness. And so he went with that. And so I'll, I'll put a link down in the description, but you all should go look at his most famous composition, uh, 433. Uh, I'll go, the link will be on Canvas, but it'll also be down in the description. Go listen to it. It's only gonna take four minutes and 33 seconds. Uh, go listen to it. And uh, if, you, if you've never heard it before, you ought to go listen to the whole thing. And when you're done, come back. Okay, are you back? All right, are you even more puzzled than when I sent you? <laughs> okay, for those of you who aren't in on the joke, it's four minutes and 33 uh, seconds of silence. It has three movements, and it's nothingness. You can't get any more radical than that. So, again, remember, if, if the modernists were all about monumentality and objecthood, the only way to rebel against that is to give somebody an anti-object, a non-object, which is silence. Now, for his part... In Zen philosophy, you contemplate the nothingness. For him, it was the sound of people in the audience that contributed to this thing. It was a moment of contemplation. That was pretty radical. Uh, you have other people like, um, you know, Allen Ginsberg, who are doing beatnik poetry, but are directly attacking and, and satirizing the world that exists. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's in this time, then, that the first evidences of the break with modernism are occurring. Uh, you have the, the arrival of what would could be called happenings. Happenings is actually a term invented by Alan Capro. Alan Capro was another one, an artist and associate of John Gage and, and others at this time. And the first happening uh, wasn't called a happening because the term hadn't been invented yet, but everybody recognizes it was a first happening and it happened very early, 1951. It happens at the Black Mountain College. It was also performed a few other areas. Uh, oh, 1950, uh, sorry, 1952. And it was a strange thing. Now, by this point, there had been a lot of experiments in theater. There had been, uh, you know, works by um, James Thurber and others. Uh, there's the very famous um, Our Town, where, you know, people got up in the audience and there were plants in the audience, people would interact with the audience, there was theater of the absurd, uh, there was all kinds of things happening. But this takes it a, a step further. And so the whole thing began, and it was a non-narrative event, and that means there's no story, there's no actors, there's no plays, there's just people performing. And it's often held up as one of the first performance pieces. And so people sat down in the theater, not really knowing what to expect. And when it was supposed to begin, uh, dancers came out onto the stage and danced their way up to the audience. Uh, but there was no music. Uh, then other uh, things would happen. People would bring step ladders into the audience, go up to the top of the step ladder and sit down and begin reading poetry. But the poetry was all different. They weren't reading the same poem. They would all read different poems. So it was kind of cacophony. Uh, all of this was against the background of what many people must have thought was a blank set, but it was actually a painting by Robert Rauschenberg, his white painting, which is a painting of white on white, which is, again, is a kind of, it's an object, but it's a non-object. It ceases to exist as an object. This goes on for 20, 30 minutes, uh, at which point, at a natural kind of lull, uh, the dancers quit dancing, go off stage. Uh, the guys on the ladders come down and walk off stage. And no one knew whether to applaud or not. There was no story, nothing. It just happened. It was an experience, something that had to be experienced. And there was no record of what was left over when you were done. So this shows just how radical 
the ideas were. If you're going to fight against the establishment and the establishment's modernism, you really have to break with the past. And you can kind of see why. Uh, Allen Ginsberg, Allen Ginsberg's po poem, Howl, which is two parts, uh, Howl 1 and Howl 2, uh, really kind of sums up their feelings about the modernist world that they had stumbled into. And it really does seem to describe this modernist architecture. Howell has one of the best opening lines in poetry everywhere. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical. Uh, really, really a great line. Uh, but it's the second part of Howell that I, I want to talk about uh, because it really has a lot of references to what was happening to American cities, the architecture and the triumph of modernism. It starts off the second part, it says, what sphinx of cement and aluminum bashed open their skulls and ate up their brains and imagination? Moloch, solitude, filth, ugliness, ash cans and unobtainable dollars, children screaming under the stairway, stairways, boys sobbing in armies, old men weeping in the parks. And so he uses this metaphor of Moloch. If you're not familiar, Moloch was this god of the Old Testament that Canaanites used to feed their children to. They, there was a fire inside a giant statue and they would place their children into its hands and the, the children would be consumed. It's considered one of the great abominations of the Bible. And the Bible says, you shall not make your children pass through the fires of Moloch. And so Moloch represents this kind of deity to which we sacrifice our children. And he's comparing modern cities. You can hear it, concrete, aluminum, uh, etc. Let me keep going. Moloch, Moloch, nightmare of Moloch, Moloch the loveless, Moloch mental, Moloch the heavy judger of men, uh, Moloch the incomprehensible, Moloch the crossbones, soulless jailhouse, and congress of sorrows. Moloch whose buildings are judgment. And it's hard not to look at these buildings and not feel that sense of judgment. Moloch whose mind is pure machinery. I love this line, Moloch whose eyes are a thousand blind windows. You can't look at one of these buildings by uh, Mies van der Rohe and not see that metaphor, a thousand blind windows. Um, and he, what he's describing is that how the cities had been rendered soulless, how modernism had papered over everything. You couldn't tell, and I often joke about this, you know, in a modernist building, you know, you can't tell what it is. Is it an office building? Is it an industrial park? Is it a school? Is it a prison? Doesn't matter. It's all the same style. There is no distinction to the architecture. And you can see, I mean, in the center is Seagram's building and are surrounded, it's surrounded by some, you know, paler uh, impersonators. My dad went to work in a Mies van der Rohe building and I never understood it until I thought it was this ugly glass box and that's what they were. And so you can hear this in the language, how everything has been consumed. Moloch, Moloch, robot apartments, invisible suburbs, skeleton treasuries, blind capitals, demonic industries, spectral nations, invincible madhouses. Goes on and on and on. It's really wonderful. You ought to read it. Uh, and so that was the modern world in the view of the counterculture. So you've got to fight back against this. You've got to resist. And the way you resist is by taking everything that modernism is and you turn it on its head. Uh, and at the heart of this was another character by the name of Robert Rauschenberg. Robert Rauschenberg was kind of on the periphery of the New York school. Uh, he and Cy Twombly uh, were lovers, but were both kind of abstract expressionist painters. Um, and they were, you know, not really in the heart of the New York school, but they were around the edges. They certainly knew, you know, Jackson Pollock and de Kooning and others, but they weren't really uh, part of the group and no one was paying attention to anything that they were painting. <laughs> so contemporary art is one part rebellion against modernism and it's also one part clever, clever uh, you know, marketing gimmick. Uh, there's a very famous line that people say, you know, all this person is laughing all the way to the bank that they're not sincere and in good judgment and it's just a gimmick. Uh, there's a They Might Be Giants song that has a line that says, uh, laugh hard, it's a long way to the bank. So never underestimate the power of a good gimmick. I mean, if you're an artist and nobody's paying attention to you, you're going to go in a direction where they will pay attention to you. And both Roy Lichtenstein and Rauschenberg said that. One of the reasons we did the things we did is because nobody was paying any attention to us. Uh, everything was modernism, everything was abstract expressionism, 
and everything that we did just looked like a poor imitation and copy of that. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to do something unique. So Rauschenberg was, you know, kind of instrumental in many areas. He was there right from the beginning, painting those paintings for theater piece number one. He was there um, doing early performance pieces, which we'll talk about later. But he was also there at the forefront of this move to push art into the realm of the conceptual, into conceptual art. So what's interesting about performance, conceptual, and pop art is that it emphasizes the concept of the thing over the object. And no better example of that can be given than Robert Rauschenberg's Erase de Kooning. Now, I'll put a link to the video in the description, but I'll also put it up on Canvas so you can look at it. Uh, it's best to hear this story told in Robert Rauschenberg's own words. Uh, and he talks about how this picture came to be. Uh, he was, but I'll just give you a concise, I guess, picture. <laughs> That's absurd. This non-picture, this non-object came to be. Uh, he was working in and around, you know, the people in the New York school, and he was trying to push paintings into what he called the all-whites. And what he meant is that he was trying to create these paintings that had nothing, that were just whiteness, emptiness. And so he started erasing his own pictures, but his pictures, he felt, weren't good enough to merit erasing, if that makes any sense. So he decided he had to have a better artist than he was, and he had to erase that picture. And so he went to de Kooning's studio and he brought up a bottle of Jack. Uh, it's always a great way to introduce yourself to Bill de Kooning. And he went there to go pitch him this idea of him giving him one of his pictures so that he could erase it. <laughs> and he was horribly nervous about it. Uh, this time, Bill de Kooning was one of the most famous painters in the world, uh, worth a lot of money, had enormous prestige, and Bill de Kooning was also an angry drunk and would you know, punch people without provocation. So it's a bit of a risk going into his studio like this. And at first he thought, well, maybe he won't be there or maybe he'll refuse me and then I'll turn it into, that will be the new work. So you see that he was already thinking that the thing that's important about this piece is the concept, not the creation, not the object. How could it be? Because there is no object, there's nothing left. And instead it would be the final thing. Uh, but eventually he and Bill de Kooning came to terms and Bill de Kooning said, well, I'm against it but I'm gonna give you something really difficult, something hard to erase, something I'll miss. And so he gave him this drawing, and apparently this drawing had charcoal, oil, pastel, all kinds of things, and he spent a month erasing it. And then he displayed it in 1953. It caused an immense shock. Uh, people said, is this, is this a challenge to the reigning masters, to modernism? Is this uh, you know, an act of vandalism? Uh, for his part, Rauschenberg said, no, I, this, was, this was kind of an act of poetry. It was, here was something that I could see and that, you know, Bill de Kooning could see, but now it's gone. It's missing. And so it pushes art firmly into the conceptual area, away from the object, because there is no object there. Uh, just a few traces of what was there on the paper before it was erased. And this can only work if you know there was something there that is now missing. And the record of it is, of course, gone, but we have this vestige. It's very bizarre. It's a very, very strange idea. Uh, but it shows that, you know, in a way he said he wasn't challenging the reigning masters, that he had a great reverence for de Kooning, but it shows that he was challenging the ideas of modernism, that the thing that makes art art is the concept of it, not the actual end product. He would also be really revolutionary in, in things like pop art. And really, I mean, I love this one because he basically takes abstract expressionist style, slapdash paint on a surface, but by moving it to his bed, it becomes something else. And so when we talk about pop art, I actually invert this. I mean, most people teach conceptual art after pop art. I teach it the other way because I actually think that pop art is an iteration of conceptual art that in the end, it's not the object that matters in pop art, even though pop art has an object, it is the concept behind the object. We, you know, you can understand a Jackson Pollock or de Kooning without any context. You just come to the painting and you experience the painting directly. But that's not true of pop art. You have to know the culture behind it. It only has value 
because it has this context, and that places the emphasis on the concept more than it places on the object. But we'll come back to Robert Rauschenberg because he was a pioneer of pop art, but he really is one of the first to break us over into this conceptual art. And the same thing is happening over in Europe. So when we start talking about Europe again, just to reiterate, it's important to know that um, Europe really got hammered by the war and it was completely destroyed, had no industrial capacity and also for a variety of economic reasons, really couldn't pull itself up by its own bootstraps. And also they had different political systems. You know, we decided to give up the regulatory regime of the wartime era and Truman just handed all that wartime assets over to our big businesses. Uh, England, they didn't do that. They kind of kept that regime in, in focus. So there were different choices, different uh, policy decisions made. Uh, and it was eventually decided that, you know, we had to rebuild Europe. And so America uh, started what became known as the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan was an enormous uh, gift of aid to Europe of everything that can possibly be imagined from raw materials like sugar to also consumer products. But you don't get anything from America without America getting something back. So this was a, a massive push by American government but it also required an enormous amount of contribution of American private industry. And American private industry was happy. The corporate world was happy to jump into this because, you know, they had uh, consumer goods. They had things like television sets and Coca-Cola and washing machines and jeans and all kinds of things that they wanted to sell to Europe. And so part of this opening up uh, and rebuilding of Europe was about American businesses establishing a cultural foothold and markets in uh, the old uh, world. And that had a very interesting impact. Uh, Coca-Cola had been around for, you know, by this point, gosh, uh, 50 years or more and had come to be a very popular drink in America. And several times the Coca-Cola company tried to break into European markets and Europeans just weren't for it. They just weren't into American sugary sodas. But after the Marshall Plan, that changed. And sodas and, you know, Levi's and all kinds of American products started streaming into Europe, mostly because Europe couldn't make its own products. And this established a foothold for American products and American consumerism. And that was seen in both a positive and negative light. So there were propaganda posters made. Uh, some were made both supporting the Marshall Plan that said, yeah, this is all us pulling together, you know, as American backing, but all of the nations are, are pulling together, but others saw it as an nefarious, nefarious kind of colonialism, uh, a kind of new kind of colonialism, instead of America conquering in a territory in the old way and taking over territory, we would just, you know, flood the area with our markets. And now American fashions, American tastes, American products are ubiquitous. Uh, it's kind of a fascinating thing that, you know, if if you're an American, you can travel all over the world. You can find Pizza Huts and McDonald's and Burger Kings. Uh, and and I don't know if you can find Chick-fil-A's, but you can find, can you find Chick-fil-A's? Is that American? I don't know. But you could find American restaurants and franchises everywhere. I think one of the things that was most shocking is I did a long tour in Greece for my dissertation and I was in Thessaloniki. And the first thing I remember uh, in Thessaloniki was getting out of the cab and there was a TGIFs right there in downtown Greece in Thessaloniki. And I'm like, why would you go to Greece to go to a, you know, a TGIF? You know, it's just kind of crazy. You know, find a, find a little hole in the wall, you know, a little, uh, you know, Greek cafe and, and get some original, some real euros or something. Why would you, why would you want to go get, you know, potato skins? Uh, but that's the truth of the matter. And this was one of the major forces of globalism. And we're still with this today. And we're still kind of going over, is this you know, a legitimate thing, or is this not a legitimate thing? And so one of the first reactions to this is going to be the new realism, nouveau realism, uh, which is this movement which starts mostly by uh, Paul Resty, which was a French art critic and poet, uh, but it also uh, involved Yves Klein, who's one of my all-time favorite um, artists. And it was an anti-consumerist movement. 
uh, and was described as neo-Dadaist at the time, that it adopted many of the absurdist methods of the Dadaists to push back against this idea of this wall of American consumerism that was entering into the world. And so here is their manifesto, and it says the Nouveau Realists have become conscious of their collective identity. Nouveau Realism uh, equals new perceptions of the real, which is kind of a obscure statement. It's kind of a hard thing to parse, but basically what that means is that they were going to acknowledge the world around them, that the new world around them was a world dominated by consumerist culture, and they were going to speak out against it. They were going to you know, uh, make fun of it, satirize it, uh, but also deal with that. So Yves Klein was, is really one of these pioneering figures, died very young, but he's a pioneer of this kind of conceptual and performance. He was a co-founder of, of this movement. And even before this movement got started in 1960, in the 1950s, he was working towards, uh, you know, figuring out how the new art world was going to go forward. He's probably most famous for patenting uh, Yves Klein blue, which is this intense color blue. And he would make these paintings of solid blue, which in a way were kind of a response to the abstract expressionists and the color field painters, but different because this color isn't applied in a gestural way, unlike Mark Rothko's or Hoffman's that you can see the brushwork or you can see it being blended out to the soft edge in multiple layers. Instead, it's, it was almost put on in a mechanical way uh, so that it has these perfectly smooth surfaces, emphasizing its kind of mechanical production. This color would then be applied to everything. You would buy little tchotchkes or statues and rendering out the color, you know, creating an, a sense of a brand, an identifiable brand. Uh, he made many different, you know, kind of paintings or structures with this using, you know, strong, you know, primary colors. But it's some of his conceptual work that's really uh, the most, uh, you know, kind of powerful. He, I, every once in a while, I'll run into somebody who finds out I teach contemporary art and they're a cynic of contemporary art and they'll say something, well, one day I'm going to make a gallery and I'm going to put nothing in it and that's going to be so absurd. And like, yeah, it's been done. And I said, well, I'll just, I'll put garbage on display. And yeah, that was done. And it was done uh, uh, nearly, uh, let me see, uh, yeah, 60 years ago. <laughs> so it, it was done. It's kind of crazy. Uh, so this is one of those examples. So this is Yves Klein's uh, La Vie, The Void, the specialization of sensibility in the raw material state and to stabilize pictorial sensibility, The Void. And what he did is he took a gallery and in this gallery, there were vitrine cases, pedestals, walls that clearly were meant to have paintings on them. And then he left them blank, left them empty. And then of course there's photos of him in these spaces or of the empty vitrine clays cases and of him gesturing to the empty walls as if there's an invisible painting, which we cannot see. So what the heck is going on here? Again, it's this denial of objecthood that, you know, it's the we, we imagine the object and we put the object up there and we imagine, okay, that's art. But a lot of that is contextual. You know, we put something on a pedestal, we put it in a gallery, put it in a vitrine glass case and a display case and automatically that elevates its status. That art is as much as the context and the trappings around that. To really drive this point home two years later, uh, he did another similar thing where he took a gallery and he just filled it with garbage. It was called La Pleme, you know, the, the filled full up. And it was the same gallery um, and it was just full of garbage. And that if you put garbage in a context of a gallery or a museum where people go see it, because they have the expectation of it being art, therefore it is art. So we see a whole wealth of experimentation at this time and it is all about the negation of the object the destruction of the object consumerism is all about objecthood and you know it's about stuff it's about your you know your new you know washer your range your television set your chair 
uh, your Barcelona chair, your Eames chair, all the things that you could own, your fancy stuff. And if you create stuff that denies the object or shows how the object is really a product of the context around it, that's a denial of it. That's really very conceptual. And so then you end up with things like this by uh, John Tingley, who was did this homage to New York. And, and in this, he had a machine that was designed to destroy itself. If you know what a Rube Goldberg contraption is, this is very much like a Rube Goldberg contraption. This is one of the few pieces that actually survived. And these machines were kind of meaningless, absurd things. Uh, this thing was kind of wound up. It had a go-kart, a bathtub, cast off objects. It was over 23 feet long. It was painted white. And once it was set into motion, an audience was brought into the sculpture garden uh, to watch it take place and it just destroyed itself. There was uh, a meteorological balloon goes up, colored smoke is gone, uh, paintings are automatically painted but then destroyed by the machine itself. Uh, a player piano and metal drums, you know, bang out a cacophony of noise before the whole thing comes to uh, a calamitous end. And it was a way, again, of showing the absurdity of this consumerism. So nouveau realism is, is very similar in Dadaism in the sense that it embraces the absurdity as a kind of demonstration of the nihilism of the world that goes around it. The same thing was true in, in some of the methods they employed. In this case, uh, balloons were filled with paint and then shot, and as, as they randomly were shot, this would cause paint to fall down uh, in kind of random ways. I, I think one of the more interesting things was Sperry, Sperry, Daniel Sperry was uh, uh, doing these things he called snare paintings or snare pictures where he would simply collect the remnants of whatever was left over from a meal or someone's breakfast uh pulling them together and so again this is the concept of the non-object of emptiness you know if a gallery full of nothing or a gallery full of garbage demonstrates how meaningless the objecthood of it is here's a meal that's no longer there it's kind of little bits of toast and food that are now gone and they're missing it is the emptiness it is the loss of what was there and also you can see that you know that's the whole point of consumerism you consume this and it's gone uh right at the same time is uh, a romanian artist who is uh, active in this same group by the name of Christo. Christo eventually goes on to do these large installations, the Wrapped Islands, and was doing them right up until last year. Um, but some of his earliest works involve taking consumer products. I um, mean, a can has a very prominent label. So a soup can, like a Campbell's soup can, which we'll talk about in uh, great detail in a little bit, uh, a Campbell's soup can has, uh, you know, a design, an idea about it. But this would take that, you know, can and wrap it and conceal it, paint it over, destroying the kind of marketing of the consumer product, making it non-viable. All of this was about kind of destroying the object in a way. Yves Klein, for his part, would also go and make uh, even more bizarre uh, creations. He would take chimps or women and he would paint them in blue paint and then have themselves press themselves or pull their bodies across canvases. Now, while at the end, this did produce an object. The object was ancillary to the performance. And so here he is, hand raised, you know, kind of directing this performance. He even went to the effort of making sure he had a little kind of uh, chamber orchestra <laughs> to provide music and then there is an audience that was watching this the absurdity of it the action of it was part of it uh, he kept pushing boundaries looking for new ways to create objects uh, building flamethrowers and, and using it to scorch canvases again flamethrowers are things that destroy but finding creation and, and making a mark by something that destroys and really got into this concept of, you know, performance. This is perhaps one of the most famous of all early performances in the sense that it was a kind of a fraud. Uh, Yves Klein was very much into Kung Fu and Chinese and Asian martial arts. This was right at the beginning of the Kung Fu craze, which would really take off in the late 60s and the 70s. 
but there was this feeling that Kung Fu gave you mystical powers, etc. And he very much, you know, played that as part of his identity, as part of the concept of, of himself. And so he got a bunch of friends together, and his friends held a blanket, and he jumped off a building and they caught him in a blanket. But then they shot this as a double exposure so that they aren't seen, so that it looks like he's falling into the void. And in reality, he wasn't. And so then he produces this photograph, and, you know, now it becomes kind of contextual evidence of this alleged superpower, this absurdity. Again, very much like Marcel Duchamp, he was creating identities, pushing absurdity as a way of demonstrating, you know, kind of the meaninglessness of something. Uh, and no one really knew quite whether to take it seriously or not. Uh, at the same time, we have a conceptual movement uh, in Italy, Arte Povera, which uh, was doing much the same thing. Probably the most significant artist uh, there is going to be uh, Piero Manzoni. Uh, Piero Manzoni is creating these things called living statues. He would take models and he would sign them. Again, this is very much like uh, Yves Klein's uh, Void. You know, if it's the gallery that makes something contextually art, then it's the artist's concept that makes something art. So if I'm an artist and I sign something, it's a work of art and it's my work of art. And so he would sign these, uh, you know, models and therefore they'd be works of art. I had a friend who actually ran into one of these uh, uh, signed artists who said, you know, by the way, I'm a work of art. And she actually had the certificate that proved it. I think by this time she was in her 60s. So uh, it'd be kind of interesting. Uh, so how absurd could that be? Of course, the fact that they're nude models adds to this because nude females are this kind of trope of classical representation. And so he, again, is subverting and inverting this. He was really good at doing this. He found many different ways to do this. Uh, I love his magic bases. Again, you put something on a pedestal in a gallery, everybody knows it's art. And so he created these pedestals and he called them magic bases so that if you stood on them, you became art. Anything contextually was art. Uh, he eventually carried this to the extreme by taking this base and putting it on the earth to conceive of this. So if you imagine the earth as a globe, uh, if you put a base on the earth uh, so that the earth stands on the base and you are a person standing uh, right here looking at that base, that of course would make the base upside down from your perspective, but right side up from the perspective of the earth. That's why this is turned inverted. So all of you on the earth are part of uh, Piero Manzoni's uh, work of art. He would do things like, you know, capture balloons of his breath. You know, the idea of breath as a source of inspiration. So whatever the artist produces, that's art. Art is something an artist produces, so therefore we bottle it up, it is art, and he even carried that to the extreme in this example by canning his own fecal matter. And so here we have, uh, you know, Piero Manzoni's, and of course it's hilarious because they are signed and numbered, almost like a, a limited edition series. Um, and he produced a bunch of photos of himself uh, creating these and then had the labels printed in a variety of languages, uh, including English, uh, French, Italian, German, etc. Uh, to this day, uh, I, I don't know what to think about these. Uh, I've known curators, I've known people who've worked in museums, and I've been told two different stories, so I'll tell you both. I don't know which one is true. Uh, but when we talk about conceptual art, a lot of this stuff isn't true, because remember, they're doing these things conceptually. It is the idea that matters, and a lot of these artists lie. <laughs> but hey, that's kind of the point, so why not? We'll move into it. So. So you have these kind of uh, conceptual pieces, uh, and I've been told two stories about uh, so-called artists. Fecal matter, uh, just trying to keep this from uh, being flagged <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, I have been told that this is uh, all a hoax, that it's all a fake, that he didn't actually can his own crap, uh, that these are filled with uh, you know clay or you know to give them the same weight and heft, but they are they are not actually crap. And I have been told by other people, oh no, that's his crap in there. And of course, uh, canned food, you know, can last a good time, four or five years, but these were canned in 1961. And so the cans are starting to break down and the putrefied interior uh, remnants are stinking up galleries. So I've heard both stories. But either way, I don't think it matters because it's the concept that matters. 
the idea that what the artist produces is art. And you can see that, at least on the European continent, artists are being very cheeky. They are really experimenting with materials and media. Here we have uh, Meritz, who was another member of the uh, um, uh, Art uh, uh, Povera movement, who would be using sandbags and, in this case, neon tubes. The line here says, uh, if the enemy masses his forces, he loses ground. If he scatters, he loses strength, uh, which was a, a famous line taken from uh, a Vietnamese uh, military general. And so again, massing earth, massing, you know, you know, forces, creating a mass, playing on words. Probably the most famous conceptual artist then would be uh, Joseph uh, Kosuth, who would create these ideas, but then he wouldn't actually execute them. He would just create them. This is his very famous one in three chairs. His one in three chairs, you know, dictates that this can be recreated anywhere um, by taking a chair, placing it against a wall, taking a photograph of that chair, blowing that photograph up to the same size as the chair, and then placing a dictionary definition of chair next to it. So which of these is the real chair? Well, obviously there's the chair, but we have the chair, the conceptual chair in our minds that's, you know, given to us by things like words, which are kind of abstractions, and then the image of the chair. And he said, you know, Kosuth said that, you know, the value of particular artists after Duchamp can be weighed according to how much they questioned the nature of art. For Joseph Kosuth, it was enough for him to write the idea down in his notebook. He would often write ideas down in his notebook and then take the page and then just pin it to the wall, but not actually execute the idea. Because once you've come up with the idea, that's the germination of the moment of art. Not the execution, the ex everything else after that is just craft. And if somebody else took care of the craft, so be it. You didn't actually have to create it. This is why I categorize pop art as a form of conceptual art, because particularly for artists like Andy Warhol, they didn't actually make the works of art that they created. They often had assistants do it. And so you don't even have to have a hand in the creation of the object. You can pass it off to anyone else. It doesn't even have to be created. The concept itself is what matters. So here's another Joseph Kosuth, you know, titled uh, Art as an Idea as Idea. And this is the word definition. So we would literally just put up on the wall, you know, a kind of definition of the word definition. That's just really kind of meta and makes your head hurt, but there it is. And Marcel Duchamp, who was the pioneer of so much of this stuff, and for many years, people thought he had kind of given up on art. You know, he kind of quit art in the 1920s, and he was such a genius person, he took up a life of chess. And there are many important chess moves that are named for him. So Marcel Duchamp goes on to be a, a, a chess player and actually invents some very famous chess moves. Uh, and everybody thought he had given up on art, but... He had developed this relationship with the Philadelphia Museum and secretly, in private, he himself was working on something conceptual. And in his will after he died, he deeded this to the Philadelphia Museum so that it could be installed. And it's this rough door, but it has two little pinholes that you can peer through. And when you peer through it, you see this bizarre scene of a naked woman lying in the grass with a waterfall she holds uh, aloft a lamp. And it's very, very strange stuff. And to this day, people have been trying to interpret what does this mean? It gives you this voyeuristic quality. And people have tried to, to suggest that it's a self-portrait in some way, that if you look at it through a right angle. But it requires you to go to the peephole to see it. Uh, again, uh, Marcel Duchamp, kind of the inventor of conceptual arts with Fountain, that urinal he turns on his side, is still right there when uh, it comes back into full force. Which leads us ultimately to pop art. So pop art, in, in a way, uh, nouveau realism is the European response to popular culture and consumer culture. But pop art is the American response. And, well, I guess I was to say British. British are in there too. The kind of Anglo-American response. And much like America, it's a lot more conflicted 
and a lot more nuanced than either Dadaism or, I think, Nouveau Realism. It too was concerned about, you know, destroying the nature of the object, but it did it by embracing commercial objects, by embracing brands. And much like Nouveau Realism, at first it, it has a kind of anti-consumerist vibe, but it has a much more nuanced relationship with pop culture than, say, Dadaism or Nouveau Realism. Nouveau Realism and Dadaism were very nihilistic, very much anti-consumerist. Pop art can be anti-consumerist, but it also acknowledges the reality that the world has just changed. And it embraces signs and what we call semiotics, symbols. It embraces the iconography. In many ways, pop art is a reaction to the search for meaning. So much of modern art, especially after World War I, was the quest for meaning. You know, surrealism is a quest for meaning in finding it in new iconography and dreamlike imagery. Uh, then you started mining the subconscious. Abstract expressionism was a sense of finding universe, meaning and universality that we could all approach. And pop art is the acknowledgement that we don't have to look for meaning. You know, A lot of art and a lot of modernism had been the search for a new universal language. And it was the acknowledgement we didn't need to find a new universal language. One had been created for us, one that we all understood. It wasn't created by artists, though. It was created by the corporate world, by mass consumerism, by mass media. It had objectified the world. And this acknowledgement and acceptance of the objectification of the world was real, whether you accepted it or not. <laughs> whether you thought it was good, whether you thought it was bad, it was just simply real. And so from the earliest pop artists, people like Richard Hamilton, we see things like this, uh, things where we have a picture that is collage, collage being very much a Dadaist technique. So when people started seeing this, they started calling it Neo-Dada for that very reason. It, it was reminiscent of Dada, but it's a little different because Dada was again deconstructing things. This is not so much deconstructing as holding up a mirror to society. Everything here is clipped from common sources. We have newsprint. We have, I love in the background, we have a romance comic. People don't realize this, but romance comics were bigger than superhero comics uh, at the time. Superhero comics were kind of passe after World War II. Uh, and it's not until the uh, Silver Age of comics that superhero comics come back because of the book uh, Seduction of Innocence, which, uh, you know, basically caused the invention of the comic book, uh, the comic book code authority so that they would be censored. But comics were horror comics, true crime, romance comics. These were like soap operas in print, and they were very, very popular, not just amongst kids, but men and women of all ages. So again, you have a Ford logo, uh, you have a Tootsie Pop, you have a ham, you have pornography mixed in, and the title is you know, lifted directly from, good grief, it could come right from that American look thing. You know, what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? There's my 1950s broadcaster voice there for you. And it was a way of saying, hey, the world had really changed. The world is now absolutely saturated in this. People were thinking in terms of consumer products. They were identifying. Identity came not from, you know, it used to be identities were ethnic or religious. Now identities, as I mentioned, you know, it's like, I said in the Christmas story, you know, some people were Presbyterians, some people were, you know, uh, Baptists. My dad was a Buick man. My family was a Pontiac family. We bought only Pontiacs, and now Pontiac doesn't even exist, so it's kind of sad. So, you know, we identify ourselves by our commercial products. So that holds it up to us. What I love about this is the floor itself is this kind of wonderful pattern that looks like an abstract expressionist piece. This was acknowledging that abstract expressionism and modernism was itself a product, was itself a kind of brand, that we associated ourselves with brand. And one of the first pioneers of this is going to be Robert Rauschenberg. So Robert Rauschenberg first creates, you know, those kind of wonderful pieces like the Erase de Kooning, etc. Uh, he himself was uh, a closeted gay man, and I think a lot of the figures in this movement are in fact 
uh, gay, closeted gay, or openly gay, in the case of Andy Warhol. And I don't think that's accidental. I think that if you, you know, if you look at the generation of abstract expressionists, they were all very heterosexual. Uh, they were womanizing, in fact. There was this kind of machismo that came from it. And these people that were on the periphery of it were excluded from society. There's something about being an outsider that allows you to see into the society to critique it. So I don't think it's accidental that uh, so many of these figures were in fact either gay, either closeted, or otherwise. And he starts painting his white on white series, but he starts experimenting by bringing his paintings out into the third dimension. In this case, by placing a chair against the painting. This is an otherwise conventional abstract expressionist piece that then spills into the third dimension out onto this chair. And it's his bed that many people regard as one of the first true works of pop art. Again, by using a recognizable object, you are pulling it and giving it a different dimension. What used to be purely, you know, kind of abstract expressionist slapdash paintwork could now be seen as something else. And it's critical that it's his bed, that his identity is being expressed here. From there, he started creating what he called combines. He would scour flea markets and uh, yard sales and old pawn shops and pick up taxidermy animals and other objects. Uh, he would start putting newsprint and start painting over the surface of the objects, sometimes creating these kind of absurdist pieces. This one is known as monogram, and it has this goat put through a spare tire standing on an assemblage of items. Uh, he had a real fondness for chicken coops. He would buy chicken coops and taxidermy and then cover them with all kinds of ephemera. Now, remember, this is 1954. This is the height of abstract expressionism. It was just the artist and this massive canvas and paint. And he started showing stuff like this, taking postcards and advertisements and putting them on surfaces in a pastiche way, in a way that no one else had, combining them together to create new forms and new ideas and expressions. Uh, a rebus in this case is, you know, if you know what a rebus is, a rebus is where you take pictures to make words and images, and that's literally what he's doing. He's taking, you know, things together and compiling them to create new imagery, adding in a little abstract expressionist brushwork, but also adding in kind of pieces as, as well. Uh, Kurt Schwitters was doing this way back in the beginning of Dadaism and elsewhere, I was out rummaging around through garbage to put things on, but the Dadaists are always doing it to kind of mock art. The pop artists are saying, no, this stuff is the visual culture of our lives, so we're going to elevate it. One of my favorite pieces then is going to be his Odalisk. Odalisk is such a fun piece because it blends two words together. Obelisk, and an obelisk is a kind of monument, and Odalisk, which is, uh, you know, a monument of art history, which is the painting of these orientalized nudes, these female nudes in, in you know, kind of exotic Islamic contexts. Uh, and so he takes a chicken coop, and he inverts the chicken coop and puts it on top of a column but the column is on a pillow. <laughs> well, a pillow isn't a very strong base at all, and that is the opposite. We think of monuments as being strong, as being stable, as being lasting, and here he takes a monument and puts it on a, a soft base, and then plastered over the chicken coop, this thing which is just a toss-off kind of piece of garbage, he puts pictures of postcards of female nudes from you know, everything from pinups to, in this case, uh, you know, uh, classical nudes from art history. So he is mixing and matching terms here, an obelisk with an odalisk to make an odalisk, spelled with L-I-S-K instead of L-I-S-Q-U-E. It's really kind of intriguing stuff. And it seems to be mocking the ideas of what monumentality are. It's mocking the ideas of what a monument in art history should be. Okie dokie. <laughs> let's, let's, I, I had a few more things to say about Rauschenberg, but I can't remember what they were. 
So let's go on to Jasper Johns. <laughs> okay. So Jasper Johns is another one of these uh, early pop artists who's was again when they started the pop artists started they didn't have a name uh, they called them the new realists not to be confused with nouveau realism uh, but they also called them neo dadaists because they were using some of the same techniques pastiche collage etc and the reason they called them the new realists is because they were engaging in symbols and recognizable shapes things that weren't like you know abstract expressionism but at the same time it was a different kind of realism it was a realism based on symbols and i think jasper johns is is one of the strongest examples of that so his works were based around recognizable things like symbols in this case targets and also faces this one has a little compartment that you can lift up to expose these casts of faces now here, uh, we could say uh, a word or two about uh, Jasper Johns and his sexuality, and I think it's actually relevant. As I've mentioned before, quite a few of the pop artists were gay or were closeted gay men. Many of them were on, operating on the periphery of the New York School. The New York School, those guys were notoriously heterosexual uh, womanizers chauvinists and as a matter of fact and this gay identity uh, whether it's Rauschenberg or Jasper Johns or others uh, really is important because they had the role of outsiders they could um, be outside of society and see in and this is one of those pieces that's been interpreted in light of this identity uh, and it's interesting because many people interpret the face, uh, and I believe it is a cast of Jasper John's own face, uh, as the target. And that was actually true. You know, a kind of interesting piece of introspection there. Uh, it was actually a crime to be gay in the 1950s and 60s. You could go to jail for it. Uh, and it was a serious offense. So it's perhaps not surprising then that Jasper John's artwork uh, reveals a kind of underbelly to the American dream and the American consumerist ideal. So for example, some of his most famous uh, paintings are going to be his flags. Now the flag is an immediately recognizable symbol. It evokes ideas of nationhood, patriotism, etc. It's become a political firebrand in our day, whether you think you should be able to burn it or whether you shouldn't be able to burn it, but it has all of this latent meaning. And so they are going to symbols that have latent meaning right inside of them. What's interesting is when you look at this flag, it's actually encaustic. Encaustic is made from beeswax, it's semi-translucent, and he paints over news, um, clippings that have been torn and pasted. So again, there's this understanding that beneath the symbolism of America, there is this ephemeral consumer culture that exists. You have to kind of look deep. What does he mean by this? How is it that, you know, you have this flag that usually is something that is venerated being made out of stuff that we would describe as, you know, toss off or uh, things that are put aside. It becomes even more interesting, I think, when we start seeing some of his other flags, uh, particularly his most famous three flags. This one has become universally uh, famous and replicated. Oh my gosh, there's... <laughs> you can go on Pinterest and find uh, do-it-yourselfers making copies of this. It's interesting. He takes the icon of the flag and he replicates it three times and stacks them on top of each other. Now, why would you do that? Well, there's uh, several concepts in economics and in visual culture, and one is pretty obvious to understand where, where does value come from, is the question. And one system of value is scarcity. There's only one Mona Lisa, therefore it's very, very valuable. There's only so many Rembrandts, so many paintings of, by certain masters, and that's why they fetch millions and millions of dollars. Uh, Scarcity is a very simple economic concept, and most people get it, but there's also something else, and it has to deal not with money, but with kind of, not with capital, but with social capital, and that's the concept of ubiquity. There's something that's so common, it's everywhere. 
Uh, let's take the Mona Lisa again. The Mona Lisa is so valuable because there's only one of it. But the Mona Lisa is so famous because everybody knows about it. It's replicated everywhere in textbooks, etc. And so the same thing is true of the American flag. It has purchase on your imagination precisely because it's repeated so many times. We instantly get it. So by taking a work of art and repeating it and multiplying it, you're showing that quality of the image. That this thing has power and it evokes power as an image because it is so reproduced. And so his explorations of the flags, often in other colors, are explorations of these themes of what do we understand, how even if he's doing this in white, in caustic on newsprint, you can still recognize this as an American flag. It also has, you know, these questions of value that's associated with it. This is one of my favorite Jasper Johns pieces. Uh, this is a couple of Ballantine ale beer cans. Uh, beer was, you know, canned since the 1930s, but it wasn't very common. Canned beer wasn't very common until about the 50s or 60s. And the point of a beer can is it's disposable. <laughs> you make it, you can it, you drink it, you toss it. And the labels on those things, of course, would have been mass produced. So a can that would have been made in of aluminum, uh, he has recast in bronze. Okay, aluminum is a disposable material, bronze is a high status material. It's what we use for bronze sculpture. And here we have the Ballantine Ale labels, which have been hand painted. Again, hand painting, craftsmanship, these are indications of value, of scarcity, of preciousness, of uh, a commodity to these things. And yet these are mass produced objects. So there's the same kind of inversion happening here that was happening in Rauschenberg's, Rauschenberg's uh, Odalisk. That is, he's inverting monumentality. He is taking the materials and the visual culture language of monumentality and applying it to things that are cheap and mass produced, creating this inversion. Now, why would you do that? What you're doing is you're kind of elevating the nature of this object. You're elevating this object saying, this is the visual culture. You know, our visual culture is found in the vast array of ephemera and disposable objects that we use. It's elevating consumerism. So one could read this as a kind of anti-consumers. It's kind of tongue in cheek, elevating something to the level of monumentality, but you could also see it as, as really just an admission that this is the new visual culture. Uh, he also does these series of maps where he will take the very recognizable shapes of the states and then destroy them, breaking them down into colors. Again, the pattern of the United States becomes a recognizable symbol. Uh, right in this is Roy Lichtenstein. So Roy Lichtenstein, his thing was taking comic book panels and he was very, very um, clear about this. People asked him why did he take comic book panels and enlarge them. And he was a commercial artist. Many of these pop artists were commercial artists before they became fine artists. So they had this experience with mass produced media. And his argument was no one was paying attention to anything you were doing. That, you know, you could paint like an abstract expressionist, you could come up with some new gimmicky way to get the paint on the canvas, and nobody was paying any attention. And you had people like Clement Greenberg saying that, you know, this is the new high art and it is completely separate from kitsched. And so the only way to cause a shock, the whole point of the avant-garde is to advance, you know, avant-garde's a military term, you know, the avant-garde is there to break up the ranks and create chaos so that you can move forward into the enemy. So the only way you could create shock was to go to the things that everybody agreed was an art, which was commercial art, which was kitsch. And what could be a higher form of kitsch than comic books? So he would take single panels of comics and comic panels and blow them up to colossal size, sometimes eight or 10 feet across. So he used the monumentality of abstract expressionism to elevate something that was usually a panel more than a couple of inches across. So again, it's this inversion of monumentality. But in the process of this, he actually simplified them. He would just throw these things up on an overhead projector and kind of trace them, but they don't actually look as good as the original drawings. 
Uh, and so I don't really belabor uh, Lichtenstein a lot. I don't show a lot of Lichtenstein because I think once you've seen it, you've got it. Again, it's this thing that the final product is not really as important as the concept. He elevated this uh, comic book aesthetic and he would rip these panels off shamelessly from established artists, uh, people like Jack Kirby, uh, Romita, um, Tommy, Tony Romita Jr., Abruzza, uh, some of the most famous uh, comic book um, artists of the time. And he would just rip them off shamelessly, taking panels, and he preferred to take the ones out of romance comics. And then he would change the captions, but, and he would also simplify the renderings. So I'll put a link down in the description. I'll put it on the canvas page. You really ought to go take a look at David Barcelou's page. David Barcelou is uh, kind of an amateur enthusiast of this, and he's actually found all of the originals that uh, Lichtenstein copied, so you can see them side by side, and you ought to go take a look at it. One of the things I really like about this comparison is that it shows that Lichtenstein isn't as good an artist as the comic book artists he was copying. <laughs> Here he was blowing these things up to, you know, the size of, you know, of uh, gigantic paintings, and yet his his line work is simpler, his anatomy is less accurate. In many ways, Lichtenstein's cartoons are more cartoony and more exaggeratedly cartoony than the comics that he is copying. One of the features of that is that he would actually copy the print process. Bende dots are little dots designed to create halftone patterns, and he would meticulously hand paint those. Again, taking something that is mass produced and inverting it by um, hand reproducing it. He would simple out, simplify out the tones, making things more black and white and solid primary colors, uh, and in a way accentuating the aesthetic. Now this is a, a troubling thing, and comic book artists have hated Lichtenstein for decades now for the very reason that they considered him a, a pure plagiarist, and I can understand why. Uh, but the reason he's not regarded as a plagiarist amongst art historians is that he was, again, recontextualizing these things. These things are fundamentally going to be conceptual pieces. He takes the aesthetic and blows it up. In a way, Lichtenstein actually elevated the knowledge of the comic book aesthetic. He brought the comic book aesthetic into the gallery, and by doing so, people started taking comic books a little bit more seriously. And it's not long before the 1970s, 1980s, that you start having comic books being regarded as a unique art form instead of just kid stuff or pulp media or mass media or something like that. As a major comic book uh, enthusiast, I always feel mixed feelings about Lichtenstein. I get what he was doing, and I guess that it's technically not plagiarism, um, but it does feel rather gimmicky. Uh, there you are. Robert Indiana is another one of these who had a more minimalist uh, style, where again, he focused in on direct symbols. You probably know him most famously for the love uh, image that was turned into a statue and it's been replicated many times. Uh, this was originally done as a greeting card for a museum, I believe. Uh, and so his stuff really crosses the boundaries between fine art and graphic design. Again, in I just had a conversation with someone the other day that, you know, graphic design uh, used to be taught under the term commercial art. Uh, there's all these terms that are meant to lower the concept of commercial art, that fine art is high, but design and other stuff are minor arts or decorative arts or commercial arts. And so again, by elevating graphic design, he's pulling that up. He would often look at things like railroad signs, or he would look at things like pinball graphic designs, and he would turn these into icons, almost stencil-like icons uh, that were, in fact, painted with stencils. So here you can see the tilt and the take all, and then he would give them titles that would, you know, kind of give the sense of consumerism and the mass media that was produced by them. He even did this to uh, American art. He would go back and look at some of those American artists from the 1920s, um, one of the most important being Charles DeMuth, and Charles DeMuth did the famous uh, figure five, I saw the figure five in gold, based on a William Carlos Williams poem. Uh, that was done in the 1920s, and then he would take that and even simplify it even more, turning it into an icon. So I think when you look at Robert Indiana, how he could, this ability to take the original and render it out into an icon, uh, that 
was a real skill. And of course, I think it's really prescient. We live in a world where everything is kind of distilled into an icon, uh, either on a user interface or on our web pages or etc., or ourselves and our social media. James Rosenquist is one of my uh, favorites of this group. He is an interesting character, again, somebody who started in the field of commercial art. And he's got his start painting billboards. Now, I actually used to work for a sign company. It was one of the first jobs I ever had. I worked for um, uh, Micon and then Idea Center. We did billboards down in Las Vegas. We also did slot machines and casino signs. And nowadays, all those billboards are just printed. They're, you know, printed digitally or they're printed on uh, Cibachrome film and backlit. At least the ones in Vegas are. Heck, some of them are LEDs now. Uh, but once upon a time, all of those billboards, those magnificent 40 foot wide, uh, you know, 10 foot high panels were all painted by hand. Uh, somebody would make the design, then they would blow it up, and then they would blow it up onto several panels. You couldn't put a single 40 foot piece up at once, so you would break it down into panels and those panels were assembled. And that's how James Rosenquist got his start. He was a billboard painter. And those billboard painters really knew their stuff. They knew how to paint at that scale so that it looked realistic from a distance, but you could do it quickly and efficiently. And he started to see uh, some of the inherent contradictions of this consumerist culture coming together in his billboards. So when the billboards, you know, a billboard is bought by an advertiser, the advertiser has the billboard up for a few months, and when it's done, they would take those panels down and repaint them, whitewash them, scramble them around, and then paint them again. The reason you would scramble them is because you didn't want the old ad bleeding through, and, you know, you didn't want people getting confused by that. So some of these billboards would have 40, 50 layers of advertisements on them. Sometimes the paint would peel off, and this would create weird juxtapositions of ads next to, get, next to each other. So he accepted that. He started putting up panels, large panels, and started mixing the kind of images that he was seeing. And this is one that he did in 1961 called The President-Elect. And so here we have a car, we have a cake ad, and of course we have the, the face of JFK. And so, it's interesting that all of these things come together to create a very consumer image. It's kind of fascinating to me that the way we sell our presidents is the same way we sell cake or cars or, you know, sidewall tires. Uh, I got a quote from him. He says, popular culture isn't freeze frame. It is images zapping by in rapid fire succession, which is why collage is such an effective way of representing contemporary life. The blur between images creates a kind of motion in the mind. And so you can see that, that he was seeing that just by chance that the method of painting billboards was producing this collage of all of these popular items and mix and matching them and putting them together. And this was very much a, a holistic kind of commentary on the life that we had. And it's his most famous painting that I think one of the most important paintings of the 20th century is going to be his F-111, uh, painted in 1964 and, and 1965. Uh, the F-111 is an enormous uh, series of panels that, when joined together, uh, take up, you know, the better part of an entire room. It's spread out over, you know, almost uh, four different walls. So there's a panorama at the top to give you a sense of it, and then here's the, the sections underneath. When we look at this, you can see that it is, again, a series, a collage of images. All of these are consumer images, uh, light bulbs, tires, cakes, uh, hair dryers, spaghetti, all of these things coming together. But behind it all is the F-111. Now, the F-111 was the high point of American technology. It was kind of a mixed fighter bomber. So my military uh, historians are going to jump in on the comments, I hope, because the F-111 is one of the most hated planes of the Vietnam era. It was neither fish nor fowl, but it was a very sophisticated plane and it was one of the chief workhorses of the Vietnam era. And so therefore it became this extension of American power. So you're sitting here looking at this and, and as you look at this, you see the subtext of this is the F-111 and in front of it is all these consumer goods, spaghetti, 
hair dryers, light bulbs, cakes, tires. You can even see that uh, behind an umbrella is a nuclear cloud. So there's a mushroom cloud under the umbrella here, which is a very evocative shape uh, because you have a, uh, a, a mushroom shape, which is, of course, the shape of a umbrella. And it also refers to the nuclear umbrella, the idea that our bombs and our bombers were protecting people and making the world safe for democracy. And this was the height of the Cold War and the ramp up on the Vietnam War. So what is this about? Well, again, it's a complex story, but it talks about the contradictions that exist in America, particularly in this post-war boom. Uh, many of you may have be familiar with the phrase, the military industrial complex, but you may not be familiar where it came from. It actually came from Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower, in his farewell address before he left the presidency, on the last day of his presidency, gave a talk. And in it, he warned about the problems of the Cold War. In past times, if a threat came to America, uh, America could rise uh, up and gather up an army and gather its forces and send it out. But America, traditionally, through most of its history, did not have a large standing army. We had to organize an army, the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, for the Civil War, and when the Civil War was over, we disbanded it. Uh, we, we gathered an army for World War I, and when it was over, we disbanded it. And we gathered an army for World War II, and we disbanded it. But the Cold War was different, because the Cold War was a war of technology, which meant we really ever couldn't stand down. Usually when a war is over, you dismantle the war machine and you enjoy the dividends of peace. But the Cold War meant you couldn't do that. It was an endless arms race. And he said the problem with that is that because you're constantly battling to have the the fastest planes, the deadliest weapons, uh, the most accurate or deadly nukes. That means you're constantly developing that technology that puts you in an arm race. And now you have a set of what we would call perverse incentives. You have whole industries that exist just to support that arm race and can milk the taxpayers for that money. <laughs> and so he says, you can't step back from the war footing, but at the same time, that war footing creates a military industrial complex that has every incentive to keep that war footing going. So it was a very, it was a difficult thing to do. And his argument was, we have to watch this. Yes, we have to stay vigilant uh, in the Cold War, but we also have to make sure that our own military industrial, <laughs> you know, uh, industry is, is not exploiting us and bleeding us dry. And of course, I'm sure you've heard all the stories of, of Pentagon uh, acquisitions and how incredibly corrupt they can be and, and how wasteful they can be. Uh, but another part of that is that it was this post-war boom that created the industrial might of America. And you really can't separate the industrial might of America from the military might from America, because that nuclear umbrella, that protection of the free world came because we had bombs, we had nukes, and we could threaten to use them. We had F-111s that we could send 12,000 miles away and use to, uh, you know, fight the conflicts in all kinds of surrogate, you know, kind of conflicts like Vietnam and Korea and etc. So it was the military might that made the world safe for democracy, but also American consumerism. In turn, that American consumerism made the money that funded the military might. So it's a snake biting its own tail. Uh, you guys didn't grow up in the Cold War, if you're my freshman. Some of you listening online might be. Uh, you guys don't know what it was like. Uh, I remember when the Berlin Wall fell down. It was a big deal. I grew up in the Cold War uh, thinking, yeah, I'm, someday I'm going to just disappear under a nuclear bomb. Uh, now I think we're, it's going to descend into Mad Max chaos, but <laughs> something is being, it's going to go out a lot weirder than I thought. But yeah, I, I grew up not far from Nellis Air Force Base and in Las Vegas, and, and I was just convinced I was going to disappear under a mushroom cloud someday. And we just kind of accepted it. It was this low-grade anxiety that everybody lived with. Uh, the movies were all about post-apocalypses, and, and you know, and you had movies like Mad Max or movies like uh, The Day After. You had 99 Luft Balloons uh, by Nina and all of these things. And I think that was just, it's just a weird world to live in. The world is booming, you have consumer goods, but it could all end in a heartbeat. And so I think this painting, especially by putting the F-111 behind everything, shows that with this commercialism, with this consumerism comes all of this latent anxiety you cannot get rid of. 
likewise, you have people like uh, Klaus Oldenburg. Uh, Klaus Oldenburg, in this case, I do not know why my mushroom cloud moved to the next page. What? Why? That's bizarre. Okay. Ah, oh, this thing. Let me draw some more. Okay, that was strange. Uh, so I, Klaus Oldenburg uh, was a Swedish American sculptor who um, brought pop art to, uh, you know, the third dimension. And he was one of the pioneers of soft sculptures. Again, using commercial materials like vinyl and new materials to create objects of the pop culture. He even had a massive installation called The Store, where he recreated all of the objects in a store that you might have, but again, in kind of soft sculptures. These sculptures were gigantic, like his giant hamburger, or his wall switch, or this fabulous, you know, floor cake. Again, taking the, the features of modern life and elevating them monumentality and scale, inverting, you know, the kind of in things that we consider to be mass produced and insignificant to a massive scale. Of course, he would later go on to do this in a series of large scale outdoor sculptures, things like the clothespin and then uh, things like his stamps and uh, typewriters, erasers became standard fare. And so he would produce those and those are all over the world now. But the elevation of the mundane, the elevation of the mass produced. Now, in all of these cases, in Klaus Oldenburg, in the case of uh, Rosenquist and others, they are using pop art, they're using pop culture as a source for their artistic inspiration. And that's, in a way, not all that different than what artists had always done. Art has always been political, it has always been involved with the arguments of the age, the issues of the age. You can go back to, say, the Dutch painting of the 17th century, particularly Dutch genre painting, and you'll see all kinds of things in the background, which are political statements, which are secret you know, Easter eggs or pop cultural references. Oh gosh, uh, Jan Vermeer's paintings are full of them. There are paintings back there that are referencing emblem books or things that are happening. Uh, in paintings like Veronese, Veronese is clearly talking about the, uh, the crisis of the Reformation and how it's impacted it because he paints this painting of what's supposed to be the Last Supper. And in that painting, he puts Swiss guards who would have been Protestant as well as Moors and all kinds of people and he has to defend this before the Inquisition. You know, they're like, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I'm just kind of filling out the scene. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big house. They probably have servants and guards. And, you know, you, you can't just drop a Protestant mercenary in the middle of the Last Supper and not, not expect the Catholic Church to get upset. So people have always borrowed on popular culture. They have always borrowed. And so when we looked at Lichtenstein or Oldenburg or Robert Indiana or any of these other pop artists that we've looked at so far, in a way, it's not all that different than what people have done. It's a massive departure from abstract expressionism, and it's a denial of abstract expressionism and this idea of this universality of modern art. And instead says, nope, art is about the now, art is about culture, Art is about our lives and what we do. And it just so happens that the consumer world is ever present in our society. So why shouldn't we make art about it? And that's, again, really not different than what any artist had ever done before. You know, popular culture pops up everywhere in all eras, uh, you know, in one way or another. But that's fundamentally different than probably the most famous pop artist, uh, Andy Warhol. So Andy Warhol, born uh, Andy Warhola, uh, was actually born just outside Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, and he was born to Ruthenian Catholic parents. Now, the Ruthenian Catholics are a minor group of Catholics that are right on the border of the Ukraine and Eastern European states, and they are Eastern in right. That means they use icons and liturgy that's very similar to the Greek Orthodox Church or Russian Orthodox Churches. However, they have allegiance to the Pope, therefore they're technically Catholics, but in many ways they very much like um, uh, Eastern Rite uh, uh, Orthodox. Uh, that's going to be significant. He grew up uh, kind of a shy 
and uh, retiring boy, but he became very, very successful early on in commercial art. He became known as an illustrator. He did lots of commercial illustrations, greeting cards, uh, very, very successful and actually made quite a good living at it. I think he has a very nice fluid line. Uh, it's his, his clarity of line, his unpreoccupied line that uh, defines him. But beginning in the late 1950s, he was moving in the direction towards uh, fine art, of breaking into the fine art world. And I think, again, it's interesting that he had this commercial uh, background. And his early pieces, he's very interested in the idea of, again, of mimicking what was mass-produced culture. And so he would take advertisements right out of newspapers, put them on an overhead projector, and trace them on a canvas and then paint them. And so they were hand-painted. So this was an advertisement for rhinoplasty or a nose job. So you have the before and after shot here. So he traced that and painted it on. He did comic books originally, but he couldn't sell them anywhere. Leo Castelli, uh, who was the gallery owner in New York City, already had Lichtenstein. And Lichtenstein was doing comic books, so he said, no, nope, I'm not going to take any more comic book artists. you got to do something different. So he went to advertisements. He loved, um, uh, you know, brands. The, the fact that there was something, again, this quality of ubiquity, there was something about them that united us all together. He particularly liked world famous brands, things like Coca-Cola, uh, things that had that resonance. And the reason he liked this is, again, he saw a kind of universality in it. He said, you know, if, if you're, a, it doesn't matter if you're the richest person in the world or if you're the Pope, if you want a Coke, you drink the same Coke as everybody else, you know? And that is equalizing. It's something bizarre about the consumer culture because it's a rat race. We're just trying to prove that we're better than everybody else. But at the same way, it's all equalizing. My dad remembers a trip he took with his dad back in the 1940s. They drove across country. And when they did, he said every 20 miles, we would stop in a different you know, town or so, or you know, every, every time we needed to fill up with gas or needed a break. And every 50 miles, every store had different potato chips and different sodas and different candy bars. And he said there was a different candy bar in you know, every 100 to 200 miles across this whole country. And he said, and by the time I got to the 60s, that was done. You know, it was Mars Bar everywhere. It was Hershey's everywhere. It was Coke everywhere. You know, they're, you know, independent bottlers. I, I'm a real fan of, of soda. I love soda and independent bottlers. Uh, and independent bottlers are making a, a comeback and, and kind of custom craft sodas are making a comeback. But that's the way it was before the 1960s. Uh, and there's a, something to be said for consistency. The reason a brand like Coke works, and believe me, I know, because I've tried, I try to make my own colas. Oh, it's really hard to make colas. Colas are complex when you make them from scratch. Anybody who takes his time can make a decent root beer. Uh, it, but it's really hard to make a, a cola. Cola has got citrus elements and vanilla elements, etc. So when Coca-Cola and Pepsi, you know, started bottling and shipping those nationwide, it was a consistent product. And so it gave people a sense of comfort. Now you could drive into any town and there was a Howard Johnson's in that town and you knew that you could get the same kind of foods you could get anywhere else. So there is something democratic about consumer culture. There is something leveling about it. And he loved this. He liked this and he enjoyed this idea that this brand, the visual culture of it, gave you that same kind of comfort. And so you would see, but he was frustrated in that many of the things that he was doing still looked hand painted. I mean, you know, he was replicating things and he didn't want that. What he wanted was something that felt like the original, that felt mass produced. So he started moving to silk screening. And silk screening was the way that a lot of, you know, packages, cartons, bottles, everything were printed in that era. Now, there's a whole endless variety of way these things are made. So he got into the silk screening process because it was not just the look of the thing that he was after. Not He wasn't just, unlike the other pop artists who were mining pop culture for material, for their artwork, 
he didn't want to do that. He wanted to replicate art in the same way that mass media was doing it. And that's different. That's really profoundly different. All of the other pop artists wanted to make art. They wanted to make art about popular culture and consumer culture, but they wanted to make art. They were making commentary on it, or they were elevating it. They were, they were you know, inverting the monumentality of art, uh, throwing it back in Clement Greenberg's face, elevating kitsch, being avant-garde, etc. And Andy Warhol really wasn't. Andy Warhol uh, was a very serious thinker who was trying to elevate pop culture to the status of art and elevate art down to the to to the to the <laughs> level of pop culture. He said once, "I've mastered the business of art. What I want to do is master the art of business." And so he didn't want to just mine pop culture. He wanted to become pop culture. And you can see that that's the case, that Andy Warhol's style is instantly recognizable. I mean, think about it. Your Instagram, you know, or your Snapchat probably has an Andy Warhol filter that will turn you into, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because I got ahead of myself. But, you know, he became famous in his, his later career for these multi images with different colored backgrounds. There's a Snapchat or an Instagram filter that will do that for you. There's no Snapchat or filter for a Robert Indiana or, or, a, or a Rosenquist. It doesn't exist. Okay. And so he wanted to fundamentally change the world. He wanted to become a brand. He recognized that we saw things and recognized things in terms of brands and that that was how we were shaping our identity. And that's what he wanted to do which is why he entered into this very famous uh, phase with his soup cans. So he was already being, I mean, he was already doing stuff and getting the attention of Newsweek. Uh, Newsweek was, was talking about these new realists. They weren't even calling pop artists then and did an article, I think 1960 on uh, a bunch of them. And Andy Warhol mentioned that he was moving into things with soup cans. And he liked Campbell's soup cans because it was immediately recognizable. It had all of these kind of associations with it. It was an immediately recognizable brand. And so he did a series of paintings. And two important things about this is actually went up in a gallery in L.A. So it's one of the first times that L.A. becomes the center of an art movement. A lot of pop artists are on the West Coast rather than it being in New York City. And originally they were selling 32 of them. And why 32? because 32 was the exact number of varieties of Campbell's soup cans produced at the time. <laughs> yeah, there's actually, uh, there's actually a, a, a bit of documentation built into this because uh, the cheddar cheese uh, soup, which is right here, was a variety that they only offered a few years in that time period and didn't offer after that. So he literally just went and copied each one of the brands of Campbell's Soup and sold them. And instantly people were captivated by it. When you looked at an individual one of these soup cans, they were, again, silk screened, meticulously done. So they looked almost exactly like the labels themselves. And at first they were selling individually, but then uh, the gallery owner realized, wait a minute, we've got something here. Let's not let it go for cheap. And he said, he called them all back and said, no, 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 this is a set. You have to buy the whole set. So now they are imagined as a whole set. Uh, again, the replication is it. Because when do you see one soup can? You never see one soup can. You go to the store, you see dozens of soup cans. And so he started this trend of making these soup cans and then printing them over the top of each other. He even liked when he got some misregisters. So you can see there's a gap here. You know, when you do a silk screen, you have several different layers that you have to do each individual color in, and that causes misregistrations and other things. And he liked that because it showed that it was manufactured, that it was not something that was handmade or painted, but it was made in the same way that it would have been made had it been done for the actual soup can. What Andy Warhol was, was getting into is something that psychologists and marketing experts now call branding. And we know that at a very early age, uh, you know, the corporate world owns a big chunk of real estate in your brain. 
Uh, kids as young as two can recognize things like McDonald's and uh, Coca-Cola and tobacco company, you know, uh, advertising. That's really terrifying. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, there was a block party on my block back when I lived in Pennsylvania and we were all going to clean up the block. And, uh, and while we were doing that, we were cleaning up the litter and my two-year-old girl at the time, who is now 23, sunrise sunset anyway <clears throat> back when my oldest was two uh she a piece of litter she picked up and she looked at it and she said dunkin donuts sure enough it was a dunkin donuts rabbit uh wrapper and and it's not because she was some kind of genius <laughs> i'm not claiming my kids were geniuses and could read it too she couldn't but she could recognize it that brand was already fixed in her imagination and so again, this is the symbol, this is how value happens is ubiquity. We all recognize Campbell's soup can, you know, whether it's McDonald's or, or Campbell's or whatever, we all recognize those brands. You know, I asked the students, I asked this of students in my class, you know, what is the name? Uh, you know, you, you get a, a runny nose, you blow your nose with a what? A Kleenex? No, you blow it with a tissue. Kleenex is a brand name. You cut your finger, you put on a Band-Aid? No, you put on an adhesive bandage. Band-Aid is a brand name. And so we, we are using the terms of the corporate world. We are identifying ourselves by the features of the corporate world. You know, what are the colors of a jar of mayonnaise? Just go. Yeah, it's going to be yellow and blue. Why? Who decided that? <laughs> That's like it came down off the mountain with Moses and suddenly all of our mayonnaise jars. Thou shalt make mayonnaise jars yellow and blue in thy color scheme. And the reason why is you had a few popular brands like Hellman's and Best Foods, which I think are two different iterations of the same company, of the same company, but they kind of set the tone and then everybody copies them because why? We're feeding into people's expectations. Andy Warhol was recognizing that the world was rapidly becoming objectified. So why shouldn't art become the object as well? Now people always say, oh, it's a gimmick, he's a sellout. Well, it's hard to say he was a sellout because he named his studio the factory. <laughs> I mean, he was very open about this fact and he hired assistants to do it. In many cases, he didn't even do the work himself. After the success of the soup cans, uh, uh, Leo Castelli in New York picked him up and said, encouraged him to do something that was a little bit more serious, uh, something that was a little bit more weighty. Now he was, Andy Warhol was obsessed with death and the concepts of death. And he loved reading obituaries. So he started what he called his disaster series or sometimes called its disaster fame series and he would take photographs out of out of newspapers uh, do a photostatic print of it do silkscreen of it and multiply it again the multiplication of images so here was a car crash he was captivated by the idea that here were people that were completely anonymous and suddenly they were thrust in the limelight and everybody knew about them it was really kind of amazing this one he was particularly, uh, you know, intrigued by. It was these two women who shared a can of tainted tuna. And so here are two anonymous people. And now suddenly their image is replicated thousands of times in newspapers all across the city. And then even more ironically, uh, what gets the larger picture? Not the women who died. These were real women who died, but the tuna can. <laughs> they have become objectified. And so by replicating the image over and over again, there's a, sep there's a certain kind of power in the replication of image. Everybody sees it. As someone who's had some recent TikTok fame himself, I can say it's really fascinating that now there's thousands of people out there that know me through that stupid TikTok video. And yet, th does, that, does that mean they really know me? It's weird. Fame is this double-edged sword that it brings you to the attention, but isn't it objectifying? You can see that in some of his other works. I mean, again, we talked about the Mona Lisa. I've seen the Mona Lisa in person uh, maybe three times now, and I honestly can't tell you what it feels like to look at the Mona Lisa in person because it's an underwhelming experience. She's behind two inches of bulletproof glass, there's a large barrier, and then there's a phalanx of tourists, thousands of them, that you have to elbow up to even get close enough to see it. I think my experience of the Mona Lisa comes not from actually seeing the Mona Lisa in person, but by seeing her in textbooks and calendars and print everywhere. And so by creating this, this colored Mona Lisa, and also by using the, the colors from the four print color process, uh, CMYK, cyan, yellow, magenta, and black. And it took me forever to figure out why black was K. Turns out it stands for key. 
Uh, anyhow, yeah, it's a good thing I went into art history instead of design. He, he's showing how it's the replication of the image that makes that famous. And what are we really valuing here? Is it really the original? Or are we valuing the fact that it's famous? And of course, that brings us to Marilyn Monroe. So Marilyn Monroe dies, presumably of a drug overdose. We're not going to get into all the conspiracies. And she dies really at the height of her fame. And she was such an interesting character because everything about her was fake. Her voice was fake. She actually had a high squeaky voice, so she had to speak low. Uh, she's the most famous blonde in the world, but she's a bleach blonde. And of course, her name is even Marilyn Monroe. She was Norma Jean Baker. But she rose to fame and became this kind of bombshell, you know, Hollywood star. She was actually a very quiet, uh, introverted person. When she died, her apartment was full of mostly books. The dresses and all the jewelry were owned by the studios. She hardly had anything. Yet here she was, this sex symbol. And it was the perfect, you know, kind of symbol of fame for Andy Warhol. Now here's where we start getting into the combination of his religious past and the present. So he takes these images of Marilyn and he starts putting a gold background. Gold in the Eastern Rite tradition represents the spiritual dimension. It's like a window onto heaven. And so what he's saying is he's elevating her to the status of an icon. We used to have religious icons, now we have pop icons. I love this diptych for that reason because it explains those complex realities of fame. First, her image is replicated many, many times to show that, you know, because we, you know, we had her image replicated so many times, we thought we knew who she was. But the form is a diptych. Diptychs are inherently religious formats. They're things that were made for altars. You would close it up when the mass wasn't on, and then you open it up for the mass. And on one side of the diptych, we have a perfect Marilyn, completely objectified, repeated perfectly. But on the other side, he used the early photo stack process. You guys don't know the struggle, man. You don't know the struggle. I remember when I was in grad school having to photocopy a book. And uh, when you photocopy something over and over, it gets degraded in images. Uh, now things are all digital, so you don't know that. But if you over uh, overcopy something, it gets overexposed. And, and then, or sometimes it gets underexposed. And so what is he saying here? It's almost the two sides of fame. That the multiplication of her image guarantee that she would exist forever but on the other side did we really know the real Marilyn you know she was not the person we imagined her to be he's showing that Marilyn has become an icon she has become an object and boy don't I know that uh, I worked for a company I mentioned that I used to do casino signs and slot machines as a designer and one of the things that we did is we made a pachinko machine of all things it was destined for casinos in Japan and uh, I designed it and we sold like a million pieces of glass for that thing and it was a Marilyn Monroe design that we had the rights to use Marilyn Monroe in gaming I actually made bank off selling Marilyn Monroe's image she's she's a bankable object she has been completely objectified uh, and that's when also the tragedy of the JFK assassination happens November 23rd uh, 1963 in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, uh, JFK is assassinated. And right next to him was his wife, Jackie Kennedy. Now, Jackie Kennedy was really uh, just an incredible figure. She was a pop icon. She was a style icon. Her pillbox hats. She was the first to actually bring people into the White House. Every year, every Christmas, the White House is redecorated and and they invite camera crews to see it. Well, she's the one that started that tradition. So she she was really considered to be glamorous and young and, and really was this incredible icon. But of course, a lot of it was fake. In reality, she was a very private woman. She had a very strained relationship with her husband who, uh, going back to Marilyn Monroe, was having a lot of extramarital affairs. And she herself had extramarital affairs, but she cared very much about his image and cared very much about their children and their family. So these wonderful scenes that we see with these kind of pillbox hats where she's happy were really kind of fake. And then of course JFK dies, uh, he's assassinated. And then came the funeral. And here are scenes taken from the funeral that you see here and here and also here and other places. And people criticized her at the time that she was very 
lacking in emotion at the funeral, but she was raised a uh, congregationalist, I think. And in their tradition, you don't show grief because that's a form of despair and you can't have despair when, you know, the resurrection is promised. So, so due to her kind of strict religious upbringing, she didn't do that. It was just kind of her way. And I think people were a little harsh on her, but it was obvious that both of these views of her were masks, that they were not the real Jackie. There's only one scene in here that might actually show the real Jackie. And it's this one here. And it's also repeated down here. And this one is taken from this photograph. It's this picture right here. And this is the swearing in of LBJ on Air Force One. Uh, she is wearing the same clothes and shirt that she wore. The blood of when her husband was assassinated, she's wearing the blood of her husband. Uh, and she's in a state of shock. Her husband is in a coffin in the cargo hold of this plane. And it's probably one of the few times that we got a sense of the real Jackie. And so Andy Warhol was really good at, at showing how, you know, what we think about people is not true. We think we know people. Mass media has made it so that we think that we know people. Think about all those Instagram influencers and et cetera. And then, you know, there's been a, quite a few stories of them, you know, committing suicide that we didn't, or having anorexia or dying. We didn't realize, you know, what was going on in their lives, but they gave this image. Would have loved to have seen what Andy Warhol would have done with social media because the objectification of the human being has, uh, you know, fully taken place. Well, then by the mid 1960s, he really starts to depart. He isn't creating art so much anymore. Uh, he starts creating things like this. Uh, the, uh, the art critic Arthur Danto, who wrote for The Nation, was actually a kind of defender of pop artists, but he goes into a show where uh, Andy Warhol shows Brillo boxes, and these are cardboard boxes that are printed to look exactly like boxes of Brillo pads. <laughs> and it causes Arthur Danto to stop and think. And he said, okay, when you're recontextualizing an image like, you know, 16 Jackies, that's definitely art. But how can we say this is art if you're making something that is indistinguishable from the original? It shows that art had moved to a point where it was now predominantly contextual. That's why pop art is really a kind of conceptual form of art, because it relies more on the concept than on the execution. If this was removed from the gallery, would you even know this is a work of art? It's, uh, you know, really a kind of fascinating thing. And this is what prompted Arthur Danto to write a series of essays that later were compiled into a book called The End of Art, where art, at least as we knew it in the grand Western tradition from the time of the Renaissance, was this product of a genius. And now art was something else. I think it was an expression of visual culture. And what he meant by that, by the end of art, was that it, not that art was going to stop, that people aren't going to stop making art. But the thing that makes art now is not this idea of the monument, the object. Rather, it is expression of visual culture. In a way, that's very similar to Hans Belting's ideas. Hans Belting wrote um, images in the era before art, I think. And he was talking about how in the Middle Ages, art is always contextual. It serves a narrative. It supports a liturgy or ritual or something else. This idea of art for art's sake is something that just would not have existed. And that's true in a lot of non-Western cultures too. And so now art had really fused with popular culture. And Andy Warhol fully embraced this. When he opened the factory, even though this was technically his studio and where he made his works of art, it actually more became a kind of nightclub for him and his entourage. He collected models, musicians, all kinds of people. Uh, he was one of the first people to be openly and flamboyantly gay, uh, which was interesting, which was a break with the past, unlike artists like Rauschenberg and others who remained in the closet for a good long time. The factory was decorated in mirrors and covered in aluminum foil uh, to give it this kind of weird surrealist aspect. He started running ads in the Village Voice saying that he would endorse any commercial product for a price. He was turning himself into a brand. In fact, at one point, he actually had an imposter go around giving lectures dressed up like him. And one of these imposters came to the University of Utah to give a lecture. And people figured out it wasn't really Andy Warhol. They figured out it was an imposter. People got very upset about this, but he said, well, you know, you know, 
I gave you a Warhol. You wanted a Warhol? I gave you a Warhol. <laughs> it's my brand, and so, you know, it's what I was. And so much of his life was kind of manufactured and fake. And again, you can't call him a sellout. He relished the fakeness of it. The whole point was to say that it's all a sellout, it's all fake. When he died, they found dressers in his house, you know, full with, with you know, wigs, you know, that even his, his signature white hair uh, wasn't real. At this time, he starts moving into kind of experimental territory. He becomes the manager for Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground uh, and a series of, of um, models and artists. And, uh, you know, there's Ultraviolet, who, again, another Utah connection here. Ultraviolet eventually convicted, uh, convicted. <laughs> that's a Freudian slip, converted to Mormonism. Uh, so that's a kind of interesting story. Uh, and many of these went on to have, you know, great careers. He started doing experimental films he did a, an experimental film called Eat that had a picture of Robert Indiana eating a hamburger. Uh, one of my favorites is Empire, where he took eight hours of slow motion footage. <laughs> eight hours of slow motion footage, uh, you know, and of just Twilight going. And so Twilight lasts maybe an hour or two, so he slowed it down to eight hours. So Twilight passing while he was doing this. He also did some very challenging things. He did Blow, which was... Uh, uh, this piece that focused in on a face, well, uh, he was, uh, oh gosh, I try to remain my wholesome attitude, but I'm talking about contemporary art, I just can't do it. Uh, anyway, let's move on. He also did uh, experimental films like Chelsea Girls, which was a weird film that had a split screen that followed two different directions. So he really was one of the most, you know, kind of revolutionary thinkers in this way. Uh, and so for a few short years there, the factory was the center point of the avant-garde and this new way of embracing this kind of idea. And it all came to uh, a very abrupt end. On June 3rd, 1968, uh, a radical feminist by the name of Valerie Solanas, who wrote a thing called uh, Scum uh, Manifesto, which was the Society for Cutting Up Men. <laughs> uh, she was this mentally disturbed person, but a radical feminist who believed in killing all men. And she came in and had an argument with Warhol. Uh, apparently he had had some contact with her. She accused him of stealing a screenplay or an idea of his, which didn't seem to be true. Uh, and then she produced a pistol and she shot him. Uh, and she also shot uh, a critic, Mario Amaya. Uh, Mario Amaya got off, got off with minor injuries, but Andy Warhol uh, had his entire ab abdominal wall collapse and had to go in for hours of surgery. And that ended the factory. That ended it. Um, he was always kind of, you know, an odd person. He was kind of an introverted and a reclusive person. It was an odd person to run this kind of strange bohemian, uh, you know, center of art and production that he produced. And he retreated into himself. Uh, Lou Reed eventually said that this is the thing that killed him. Uh, because, you know, he isolated himself and then he needed some surgery. He delayed the surgery, uh, gallbladder surgery, and because of complications of the shooting, he eventually died uh, 19 years later. So even though he didn't die then, many people think that uh, Valerie Solanas was responsible for his death. And uh, he didn't talk about it much. In fact, this picture by Alice Neal is one of the few times that he ever opened up to anybody and allowed someone to see the massive scarring and the trust that he had to wear for the rest of his life to keep his innards in and from uh, falling apart. Uh, he said this about the attack. He said, before I was shot, I always thought that I was more half there than all there. I always suspected that I was watching TV instead of living life. People sometimes say that the way things happen in movies is unreal, but actually it's the way things happen in life that's unreal. The movies make emotions look so strong and real, whereas when things really do happen to you, it's like watching television. You don't feel anything. Right when I was being shot and ever since, I knew that I was watching television. The channel switch, but it's all television. And I think that's pretty profound kind of statement on what he was saying about pop culture and what consumerism was doing to all of us, that we had been in a way alienated from life. So in the 70s, he entered into a kind of uh, a dark period where he was at the center of the art world. It's interesting, he was kind of this flash in a pan, he disappears, and uh, pop art and art world went in different directions. So he managed to make a living by selling portraits. He kind of became a, 
what people said was a court painter to the rich and famous, selling paintings for 25 grand a pop uh, to people like Mick Jagger, who wanted a, the Warhol treatment. Um, by the 80s, his fame rose again, uh, precisely because so many of the things that he predicted and discussed, this kind of mass commercialization, were fully embraced in the 80s. The 80s embraced that kind of materialism and kind of reveled in it in a way, in a way that the 60s were kind of rejecting it. And that brought it back to people's mind. And so he started making these uh, multicolor portraits again. Uh, and he started also experimenting with imagery. He remained throughout his life, strangely, uh, a devout Catholic. Uh, he had a personal um, audience with Pope John Paul II. He never missed mass. He dutifully took care of his mother. Even though he was openly gay, he asserted that he was a virgin at his death. And there's been some debate about that, but no, no evidence either way has come forward to confirm that. Uh, so uh, the thing that you know, people have always questioned this is how could this crazy bohemian guy uh, claim he was a devout Catholic? Well, many people, including other artists who had lost their faith, came to him and, you know, and he said, no, 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 you got to believe in God. And he, he actually converted people. And so, you know, I take their word for it. I mean, you know, if you're willing to convert other people, that's got to be the case. And so he explored some of that imagery and blending here the Last Supper with the image of the corporate world. Uh, again, uh, his religious sensibility has endured to the end. Uh, and I think he is very prescient in the fact that the corporate world has in many ways replaced uh, the religious icons of the past. Uh, really kind of uh, interesting. Well, uh, I lost this lecture and because uh, the mic went dead. And so I lost 45 minutes of the lecture. And here I am and I somehow managed to redo it and add another 15 minutes. So sorry this lecture went really long. Uh, but I do think it's very important to understanding how we have this massive break. And so next time we're going to talk about some of the performances that happened in the 60s and 70s, some of the crazier things that happened, and how we reaffirm this break with abstract expressionism and how modernism is completely inverted. Thanks so much for hanging in there. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye.